Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. This is the post-game podcast from the Timberwolves' big win over the LA Clippers on Sunday at Target Center. We'll break down how the Wolves stopped the Clippers' big three. Uh, a fantastic defensive performance, but the offensive performance was nearly just as good for stretches in this game. It was a bit sloggy at times, but I would say overall a near-perfect Wolves performance against a really difficult opponent. We'll break it all down on the show today. Welcome in. You are Locked On Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I'm the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com and use code Locked On to get $20 off your order. That's Jace Medical, J A S E Medical.com. Happy Monday, everybody, and uh, happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day as well. The Timberwolves are not in action on this MLK Day. Um, and those matinee games are, are fun that the Wolves have played in the past, but not in action today. Of course, two big wins over the weekend. Uh, Friday night, the Timberwolves uh, dominated the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, a really impressive performance, uh, you know, all the way through. Uh, extremely one of the least competitive NBA games I've seen in a while. And then uh, Sunday night, uh, an even more impressive, I think, win against the Clippers. It ended up just being a four point win, but they were in control for basically the whole game. And we're, we're dominant in stretches on both ends of the floor. And I know offensively it was clunky at times, but I thought I, I overall this was a really strong performance against an opponent that's really good at both ends of the floor in the Clippers. So uh, we'll talk about the whole game here today in the postgame pod. I want to break down some individual performances as well as some key takeaways. So we'll do all that here on the show today. A big thank you, first of all, for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow an X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C-K-E-N. All right, so setting the stage real quickly, the Clippers were virtually at full strength. They did not have a Vita Zubats, who was a late scratch from the, in this game with the calf. Uh, so that's significant. It obviously hurts them primarily on the glass. It would would be the biggest thing, um, but you know it means that you know Mason Plumlee's got to play significant minutes, rotation minutes. This is a team that normally is a top ten offensive rebounding team, and Zubats is a big reason for that. Uh, he grabs more than three offensive boards a game, which is more than twice as many as anyone else on the Clippers team. He's their best uh, def offensive rebounder by in terms of uh, rate as well. So I don't act like that's not significant, but their big three did play. And this is a Clippers team that had only lost three games since the start of December. Uh, I believe that's the NBA's record, best record since December 1st. They've been fantastic. And things really have started to click, you know, a couple weeks clear of the James Harden trade, but all three of those guys on the floor, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, James Harden, they all played. And the Timberwolves mostly controlled this game. And, and like, I mean, it was a, what was it at halftime? It was only a one point. I think, yeah, the Wolves were only up one at halftime. The second quarter was a bit rough for Minnesota. But for the most part, it never really felt like, other than a couple moments late second quarter, this game felt like the Wolves had it in control the whole time. And, you know, it was a, a late Clippers run where they just made a bunch of threes. It was like a 20 to four run in the fourth quarter that really, I don't think the Wolves played all that poorly defensively. We'll talk a little bit more about it. We'll talk about Hackerudy here in a minute, too, because that was uh, an important piece of this that I thought contributed to this, this uh, closer finish than it needed to be. And there were some in intriguing moments, whether it was the um, the um, Terrence Mann, Rudy Gobert dust up or the Russell Westbrook, you know, the Rudy Gobert airballed free throws and the Russell Westbrook and the Clippers bench reaction. And then, of course, Rudy coming down, hitting clutch free throws to seal the game when they try to play like Hacker Rudy. And then Russ biffing a layup that would have cut the, it, it, you know, it would have cut it from four to two with like two seconds left. So ultimately, probably doesn't matter unless they steal the inbounds pass. But it, comical, right? Uh, and, and, uh, I believe Jim Peterson said on the broadcast, it, karma, right? Um, so lots of fun stuff in this game, a little bit of a weird game, but when it all is said and done, 
the Timberwolves beat the hottest team in the NBA and one of the best, probably certainly four teams in the West. I mean, like right now it's the Wolves and Thunder and the Nuggets and the Clippers. Like those are your best four teams in the West, hands down. Um, and they beat them, I thought, fairly handily and impressively in this game. So um, let's let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about the offense in general, because, you know, at first glance, they only score 109 points. They only had 46 points at halftime. They're at 46, 45 at halftime. And things were certainly clunky at times. They also turned it over 17 times in this game. I'm going to throw up the stats if you're watching on YouTube. They had 17 turnovers in this game. But look at the first number uh, on this chart. The Timberwolves shot almost 57% from the field in this game. They were 50% on three-point attempts. They didn't get enough three-point attempts up. But they shot 13 to 26, 50% on threes, nearly 57% overall from the field. And they won the points of the paint battle 44 to 36, a plus eight in points in the paint. Again, no Zubats helps there. But the Timberwolves did what they needed to do against the team that decided like, hey, let's just try and go small because nothing else is working. So Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns dominate the paint. And that's that's kind of how this game goes. So yeah, the 18 turnovers, or, there's no, or 17 turnovers, excuse me, no question about it. Sloppy at times. I would say herky-jerky at times from an offensive perspective. But this team shot 57% from the field, 50% from three, and got to the line 31 times. Now, the Clippers weren't called for a foul on the defensive end of the floor until like late, late first quarter. In fact, the first quarter was the opposite of how the rest of the game went in terms of foul calls. And the Wolves still won the first quarter by 10 points. Ultimately, they got to the line 31 times. If this team just makes, I don't know, say they go 25 of 31 from the from the free throw line, which is what? Like, uh, quick math tells me that's what? 80% for the line. That's not crazy. I mean, for the season, the Wolves are uh, shooting about that. They're 79% for the line for the season. So say they shoot their their season average from the line. That's an extra five points, and this is a nine-point win, right? This game's not as close if the Wolves simply make a few more free throws. And uh, I don't think that would be all too much to ask. Now, of course, Rudy shot the vast majority. I shouldn't say the vast majority, but nearly half of those free throws himself. So that's part of the reason why it was so low. But still, as a team, if they make a few more free throws, this isn't all that close of a game. The issue with the offense in this game was more herky-jerky because it felt like they were almost overpassing at times. But in general, and this this is a, a, a kind of a broad blanket statement, but in general, I think overpassing is preferable to the high amount of isolation ball that this team plays at times anyway. And, and there were a couple of moments in this game where Anthony Edwards kind of devolved into playing iso ball himself like late third quarter when the Wolves were trying to build a lead. Um, there were a couple of possessions, I think three straight possessions, right? Never passed the ball. And it was just like, you know, almost made a couple of tough shots, almost got fouled, but he did it. And there were just empty possessions, right? That still happens. And, you know, he's such a good and dynamic offensive player that the Wolves can get away with it and still win most of these games. And they, they have been. But besides those, that I would say small handful of possessions, probably less than five. The ball moved really well in this game. We saw a little bit of Carl Anthony Towns creating from the top. He had five assists in this game. Um, he also had four turnovers, right? We saw Anthony Edwards have six assists, but he also had five turnovers. Even Mike Conley had a couple of uncharacteristic. He had a double dribble in this game, which is weird. Like uh, There were some weird things that happened too, but overall, it was because the ball was moving so much, and they were making the Clippers guard both sides of the floor, and they were actually swinging the ball from one side of the floor to the other. They were making skip passes. They were driving and kicking like these things that this offense hasn't consistently done this season. And it wasn't like a horrible too many turnover game. Again, a couple silly ones like uh, there was a wasn't there. Oh, first possession of the game was a shot clock violation because the ball there was a uh, ball had to be inbounded on the side out of bounds or something. And and Ant didn't realize the shot clock was already at like five or six or whatever. When he got the ball shot clock violation in the first possession, Conley double dribble, like a few of the silly ones. This wasn't one of those games where it was careless out of bounds passes, careless, completely careless live ball turnovers. There were a couple, don't get me wrong, but this was more a function of almost too much offensive ball movement. They were trying to do the right thing. They were the it was the best intentions. It wasn't let's be the globe trotters or let's be careless and you know not be completely uh you know locked in on this game. Those weren't issues in this game. They just overpassed a little bit. And because they shot the ball so well from the field and they got to the line a bunch, they ended up winning this game by four and it easily 
like I said, should have been eight, nine or 10 points. They should have won this game by. So uh, I would take that offensive performance over some of these other ones where they're turning it over 20, 22 times, like, you know, the Thunder game right after Christmas or a couple games between Christmas and now where it's just been like turnover city and it just feels different than what it was in this game. And then also coupling that with not shooting the ball that well, missing open shots. And that's how you got a few more L's during the stretch. But overall, I thought a solid offensive performance. I want to talk more about the defense because they were even more impressive on that end of the floor, what they limited the Clippers to. And then my overall key takeaway is I want to talk about Hacker Rudy, and then eventually we get to individual studs and duds here as well. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at Jace Medical. I know we all come to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities in real life, but let's just talk for a minute about preparing for actual real life. According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, which is overall pretty scary. Can't imagine a more helpless feeling that if someone in my family or you know uh, someone I'm close to got sick while supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medication that they need. Thankfully, we'll be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. This stuff could happen to any of us. Visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It will be reviewed by a board-certified physician, and your medications will be dispensed by a licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use the offer code LOCKEDON to get $20 off your order. That's jacemedical.com, offer code LOCKEDON to get $20 off your order. Lockdown has launched the first ever national sports 24 seven streaming channel on YouTube. Lockdown sports today is here for you 24 seven covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of lockdown. Plus our national shows covering every league. Go to lockdown sports today on YouTube and subscribe to the first ever national sports 24 seven streaming channel. All right. Um, additional or all, like overall key takeaways from this game. Let's talk Hacker Rudy. Uh, I, yeah, let's let's go there. So overall in this game, of course, Rudy airballs those two free throws or the one airball, the one near airball early in the game. And he at one point was, what, two of seven, I think, from the line. And it was three of 10 at one point. Um, and then they decided to play Hacker Rudy around the six minute mark of the fourth quarter. And you could see actually right before they did that, there was a play where Rudy, I think, got a dunk. And you can see Ty Lu, as the Clippers are going back down on defense, telling his team, like motioning, like, hey, foul him if he if he catches the ball, right? The very next possession, Cat throws a lob to Rudy for an alley oop dunk, which was awesome. Um, and then shortly thereafter, they start hacker Rudy. And it's, you know, it's always a little uncomfortable when that happens. And you were you like, what you got to make at least one out of two in order to make them question, like, hey, is this worth a while? Of course. Giving up one point per possession is usually a winning proposition for an opposing defense. So overall, that's a success for the Clippers if he makes one out of two every single time, um, as long as the Clippers are scoring in there to the floor, right? But that's, I guess, always true. He goes one out of two in each of those trips. The Wolves call a timeout because the Clippers just kept scoring on their on on their end of the floor. So Finch calls a timeout to stop the run, and it was just it was more to stop the run. I, I'm pretty confident than it was to get Rudy off the floor. Because, but but I will also say that Ty Lue's strategy to foul Rudy Gobert disrupted the momentum, disrupted the flow of the game enough that I would say it was successful for the Clippers, even if Rudy Gobert was still making one out of two and at least making them question their strategy. So, it, like, even though it didn't necessarily work, it still got the Clippers to where they needed to be, and it ended up, it, it, it kind of spurred them into, uh, you know, um, being in the game down the stretch. It was a 16 point game when they started following Rudy Gobert. He makes one or two the first time at the line. They go up 17. The Clippers score a quick five to make it a 12 point game. They follow him again. He makes one out of two. It's a 13 point game. And then the Clippers pretty quickly get it down to, uh, by the time Gobert is out of the game, it's a, uh, let's see, it's a nine point game when Gobert comes out of the game. Or I'm sorry, a 10 point game when Gobert comes out of the game. So it goes, it, when when they first started Hacker Rudy, it's a 17-point game. When he comes out, it's a 10-point game. When Gobert comes back in for the final couple minutes, because, of course, you can't 
you can't get take fouls in the final two minutes off the ball. It's a nine point game. And so the Wolves basically held serve at that point, but the Clippers mucked things up enough with that, that it disrupted the rhythm. Would I be concerned about the strategy in general? Short answer is no, because if teams are resorting to it, it means that likely something else is working and the Wolves are in a pretty good position. Also, the Wolves also have another all NBA center in Carl Anthony Towns, who's been pretty good defensively this year and another starting caliber big in Nas Reed and another starting caliber four in Kyle Anderson that can play the four next to either Nas or, you know, I guess better next to Carl Anthony Towns, or you can play the three of them together. So they've got other options. Plus Rudy as a player, he's shooting basically his career average at the free throw line this year. Like he's been as good as 69%, as bad as like 62%. And he's right around 63% coming into this game. But the interesting thing with Rudy is, he either it this is maybe oversimplified a little bit. I, I pulled some numbers. He basically is either pretty good at the line or terrible at the line. He's very rarely shoots around his average. Less than a third of his games this year has he shot between 50 and 75% from the line. Usually he's horrible or he's good. As weird as that is. Way back that Boston game, remember the first win against Boston in overtime in November? He was two eleven, two of eleven from the line. He had a couple other really bad ones in there. He had a uh uh let's see. Actually, maybe less really bad ones than you might think. He had the two of 11. He had a two of seven, two for seven in that Knicks, the first Knicks game, the win at home. Um, he had a couple others, like a one for four, you know, a one for three, stuff like a couple of one for fours in there. But then he's also got like a six for eight and he's got a seven for 10 and he's got an eight of 11 and a nine of 12. Like it very rarely is on the nose near his percentage. And this was one of those games where it made sense for the Clippers to try it because he looked very lost at the line, the way he was missing them. Overall, there's a reason we don't see teams do this frequently. Gobert, I, he's had a quotes before. I think he had one last season. It's similar to what, remember Shaq always said about Hackashack, I make them when it matters, which is of course silly to say because they all matter. They all count the same, right? I, I, I know what he means. They all count the same. And if you make them early in the game or whatever, then they wouldn't try it late in the game. But that's exactly what happened here is Rudy made those four free throws down the stretch as the Clippers were intentionally following him, not technically take fouls, but intentionally following him to get him to the line. And he made all four of them, which again, karma for the Clippers making fun of him on the bench. So he ends up for the game. Rudy ends up shooting seven to 14 from the line, which of course is below his average and not good, but he made his last four free throws. He was three of 10 before he made four of his last four free throws down the stretch to salt the game away. So I don't think this is a, a strategy necessarily that Wolves need to Wolves fans need to wring their hands about. I don't think too many teams are going to roll this out. We're not going to see it in the playoffs unless the team is desperate and the Wolves have options if they go to it. I think there's enough of a variance, like either Rudy's going great or he's going terribly. If he's shooting free throws well during the game, I wouldn't worry about him missing free throws down the stretch. Um, probably the biggest takeaway here was how amazing the Wolves defense was on the Clippers superstars. I mean, those are the the three toughest or the team that has the three toughest. They're not literally the three best perimeter scorers anymore in the league, but there's no team that has as many really, you know, difficult to deal with perimeter scorers. James Harden was four of 14 in this game. For, it took him 14 shots to get 14 points. He also had four turnovers. Paul George shot just five of 19. And most of those weren't open shots. The Wolves did a really good job contesting shots. Kawhi ended up with 26 on 19 shots and he had nine rebounds, only one turnover. He was pretty good. But Rudy Gobert blocked a couple of his mid-range jumpers and had a couple of really good contests on him. Um, short of a couple like somewhat lazy defensive possessions where the Wolves just didn't get out to the perimeter and contest, for the most part, they were active defensively. And I was surprised the Clippers ended up shooting 44% from outside the arc and, and almost 44% from the field overall. But again, it was that hot streak late in the fourth quarter. They were making some tough shots. They generated a couple of open looks. I mean, Russell Westbrook, Hit a couple of threes in this game. That was weird. Norman Powell hit some big shots. He had a big corner three late that kept this thing interesting. So I thought the Wolves did an incredible job defensively, and it was the individual defensive effort, especially Jaden McDaniels, D.K. Alexander Walker, Anthony Edwards, but also Mike Conley, Kyle Anderson. All these guys were solid defensively. And this is exactly the type of team like Boston's another one. Obviously, the Wolves split that series, but both those go to overtime. Um, Dallas is another one. I know they lost the last time they played Dallas, but I like the matchup for Minnesota like the Dallas's, the Boston's, the Clippers of the world, teams that like to play iso ball that have length, the Wolves have just as much as much length. They may not have as many iso ball dominant scorers on their team, right? Like 
obviously the Mavs have Luka and Kyrie and the Celtics have Tatum and Jalen Brown and the Clippers have Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, James Harden. The Wolves really only have Anthony Edwards. And I mean, I wouldn't include Carl Anthony Towns in that same category in terms of, um, you know, you don't just get, he doesn't bring the ball up the floor, just let him go. Right. But in terms of being able to guard, like the Wolves don't have to play that way themselves offensively. The But if you're just guarding a team that loves to go ISO on offense, Minnesota has Jaden McDaniels and Nikhil Alexander Walker, two of the best individual defenders in the league that they can put on you. They have Rudy Gobert roaming the paint, you know, four blocks in this game, including a couple on Kawhi. And you also have Kyle Anderson and Mike Conley, two plus team defenders who are still solid enough on the ball. And I, like, I, oh, I didn't even mention Anthony Edwards. Like I, I put Ant closer to the, Nik- I mean, he's really in the Nikhil um, Jaden conversation in terms of how good his perimeter defense is. So the Wolves match up really well against these teams that are ISO heavy on offense. Uh, that's for sure. Um, I talked a little bit already about the turnover issues. That was my other takeaway, I guess. Uh, but again, I think it was overall good ball movement and I'd rather have them overpass and have some of these turnovers that are well-intentioned turnovers that don't, you know, I think it was 10 first half turnovers that led to 11 Clippers points in the first half. A few too many live ball turnovers. Um, but again, it didn't seem to completely kill them in this game because they were like, I thought the transition defense was good enough. And obviously the Clippers like aren't going to kill you in the open floor necessarily. Like that's not really what they're about. Uh, they're actually 25th in pace in the league. So I think that helped them. I'd rather dial back the overpassing than be like, hey, they're playing too much. You know, the ball's too sticky. They're they're not swinging the ball enough on offense. So I thought overall that was permissible in this game when it was all said and done. All right, let's talk individual studs and duds, and that's how we'll close out the show here today. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our friends at FanDuel. The NFL playoffs are in week two or will be in week two this week. Actually, there's still two playoff games today. Actually, two now with the Buffalo game that was moved to today. So two games this afternoon and tonight. But also the divisional round starts this coming weekend, Saturday and Sunday. The best weekend of football is this weekend. Uh, there's still plenty of time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. It's $150 bucks in bonus bets. Win or lose. The app is so easy to use, and there are so many different ways to bet, like live same-game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub. It's the best way to find popular parlays and so much more. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, let's close the game out with individual studs and duds here. Um... Obviously, Anthony Edwards has to be a stud in this game. I haven't really talked about his game all that much. He did have five turnovers, but, and, you know, there's a couple of possessions I talked about. I think it was third quarter where he got a little sucked into playing ISO ball, but he was super efficient. 33 points on 16 shots. Another game where he got a dozen free throws. Um, I, I shouldn't say another with the, well, actually, yeah, he's had other games with a dozen free throws, but really another game with double digit free throws. The month of, uh, of January, he's had, I guess it's been a little while since that's happened. He's now had three games of the month of January. You go back to Christmas. He had he had a run of five consecutive games. He had double digit free throws. So you go back to Christmas. The Thunder game after was the start of that run. He had five straight games with double digit free throws. Then he had five without, and now he was back on that trend. So six of the last eleven games has Anthony Edwards shot double digit free throws, but he only had two attempts at the line on Friday against Portland. That was a shorter shorter minutes because that is such a blowout. But anyway, good to see him living back at the line, hit a couple of threes, which is good after he didn't hit any against Portland and had been in a bit of a swoon from outside the arc. Um, so a well-rounded game for Anthony Edwards. And like I said, fantastic defense from Ant as well. Finished with 33, nine rebounds, six assists and two steals in this game. Again, 10 of 16 from the floor, two of four outside the arc, 11 of 12 at the line. Um, I'm going to go Carl Anthony Towns with a stud in this one as well. 17 points. On 7 of 12 shooting, 2 of 4 outside the arc for him as well. 1 of 2 at the line, 6 rebounds, 5 assists. He did have 4 turnovers. He was also a plus 12 in this game. Um, I thought Cat was really good. This was just a well-rounded, you know, not a spectacular Cat game other than the dunk he had, which was incredible, uh, which somehow Westbrook nor Ty, Ty Lue got technical fouls after that. That was weird. But uh, another really good Cat game. And then I've got to give one to Rudy, too. 
15 points, 18 rebounds. We talked about his line already. He just shot the ball five times in this game. In fact, I think he only had one shot attempt in the first half. He ended up being four or five from the field, seven to 14 at the line, but he hit the four clutch free throws. He also hoovered up 18 rebounds and helped the Wolves be a plus seven on the glass overall in this game in a game where Ivica Zubats didn't play. So it was really important that Minnesota controlled the paint and they did. There were plus eight points in the paint, plus seven on the glass. Rudy had four of the Wolves, five blocks, and he had 18 of their 41 rebounds. The Clippers didn't have anybody with more than nine rebounds in this game. So Rudy had twice as many rebounds as the Clippers' highest rebound man, and that was Kawhi Leonard. Daniel Tice started at center and only played 22 minutes because the Clippers elected to play small down the stretch with Norman Powell. And, uh, you know, Rudy just controlled the paint. He just controlled the paint. Hack Rudy ended up not mattering. Um, I thought Jaden McDaniels also played well. He had a couple of tough spot, tough shots in the paint. I guess I'd give him a fourth stud in this game. 14 points on 10 shots. Knocked down a couple of threes. Hit a big uh, slot three from the right side of the floor that pushed the Wolves lead. I think it pushed it from six to nine, if I'm not mistaken, in the final couple of minutes when uh, when the Clippers were trying to make a, a you know a continued, a sustained push. He hit a, a big open three. Uh, four assists, two steals. Four rebounds. He did have four turnovers, but again, fantastic defense in this game from Jaden McDaniels. Just a, a really well, uh, a well uh, executed two way game from Jaden. So I think he deserves a stud as well. No duds in this game. I thought everyone played well. Um, you know, Mike uh, Conley only had was two of six outside the arc. He had two turnovers, which is not bad for your starting point guard, but not typical for Mike Conley that he had more than one. Like he didn't have a bad game though. And the wolves actually, Chris Finch only played eight guys in this game. Now they've got the next two nights off. They don't play again until Wednesday. So I'm sure that factored into the decision. Um, but only eight guys played no Jordan McLaughlin, no Troy Brown jr. In, in the rotation in this game, just Nas who only played 14 minutes off the bench. Nikhil Alexander Walker played 20 and Kyle Anderson played 27. Kyle Anderson, by the way, a uh, special shout out to Kyle was really good late. Um, the Wolves needed him to do a bit of, of guarding on the perimeter. I thought he was solid, even when he was on an island against some of these guys that are so dynamic offensively, uh, this big three of the Clippers. He was really good uh, when they went small a couple of times, when they got had to take Rudy off the floor uh, or chose to take Rudy off the floor in the final you know five minutes or so of the game. Kyle Anderson had some solid minutes. Then they left him in and took Cat off the floor, and he was really good then too. So just a, a really good Kyle Anderson game as well. Overall, I thought this was one of the most complete wins for the Wolves this year. It wasn't, it was a fun game. It wasn't necessarily a dominant performance, but it was just a clean, relatively clean. I, I turned it over 17 times, but a, a, a well rounded game, I think is the best way to say it. And I was, I was really happy with the performance against a hot team, a top five offensive team, a top 10 defensive team in the Clippers. I didn't even say that off the top. Coming into the game, the Clippers, according to basketball reference, were the number five rated offense in the entire league and the number 11 defense in the league. Um, and again, the hottest team in the league since the beginning of December and the wolves took on a mostly almost full strength Clippers team and beat them pretty convincingly in this game. As mentioned, the wolves don't play again until Wednesday. They go to Detroit, which is, well, we'll talk more about it on Wednesday. Um, I don't want to say I'm worried about it because it's the Pistons. They've won three games. I'm not worried about it, but it's the weird one game road trip. The Pistons just lost by two to Houston last time out. Like, uh, you know, I don't know what the line's going to be. We'll talk about that later in the week. We'll talk about the matchup, you know, what the Pistons have been up to. But uh, anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. Now they go to Detroit on Wednesday. Then they come back home for a couple of home games, including the Thunder this weekend, too. So a uh, an intriguing weekend or week upcoming, I should say, for the Wolves. All right, that's all we have for today here on the show. A big thank you to those of you that do make Locked on Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, Locked on Wolves is free and available everywhere, including YouTube, as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Locked on Wolves. Of course, you can also watch on the Locked on Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Locked on T-Wolves and also at B-Beacon with two Bs, two E's, CK. Ian. Of course, the Lockdown Wolves podcast is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Remember, the Lockdown Network is your local experts on all the biggest stories. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.